of Worship, your source for commentary and discussion on worship, theology, and culture. I'm your host, Dr. Jonathan Michael Jones. Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Jonathan Michael Jones here on the Act of Worship podcast. Uh, Thanks for joining me today as we discuss things theological in nature, uh, worship, and sometimes some cultural and social issues. Today, I'm going to be talking about the biblical topic of avoiding the appearance of evil. Uh, The Apostle Paul tells us to abstain from every form of evil in 1 Thessalonians 5.22. My preferred Bible of choice that I most often use is the ESV. Now, that does not mean I don't use other versions and translations, because I certainly do, uh, particularly when I'm uh, studying, um, because they all have their reasons for uh, what they say, some good, some bad, but um, the ESV says uh, in that particular scripture to avoid every form of evil. Other translations, such as the King James, the uh, uh, the uh, TPT, the AKJV, all kinds of there are other translations that use the word appearance. Uh, avoid the appearance of evil. Um, In our English language, form and appearance really have two disparate meanings and implications. And so Paul's instructions here are often stretched in many directions to fit one's theological interpretation. I'm not saying that is right, but that often happens, um, as it does with many other uh, scriptures as well. Um, And I don't want to downplay the instruction. It's a vital instruction, but we have to discern and interpret uh, the intention behind Paul's words here. The line between uh, clarity and ambiguity in these directions sometimes is imprecise. And so um, what it does is it forces Christians to a variety of personal interpretations, and many of them believe that their way is right and the others are wrong. Um, And so certainly there's room for disagreement here, but we have to determine what Paul's words mean based on sound reason and and sound doctrine. And so I have four personal thoughts I would like to give regarding the appearance or the form of evil and what it is, uh, and particularly this instruction. So the first thought I have is that it is better always to err on the side of holiness rather than evil. Um. Uh, when we're discussing subject, subjective and hermene- hermeneutical issues, uh, if you're not familiar with that term hermeneutical, hermeneutics, it is an interpretation, and everyone has a hermeneutic, good or bad, reasoned or not, everyone has a hermeneutic. When you're reading commentaries, um, I would suggest to you that there is no such thing as an uninterpreted commentary. Uh, People may say, well, this author is neutral, but they are not. Trust me, there is no such thing as a neutral commentary. Everybody has a hermeneutic. So when we're discussing hermeneutical issues, our arguments are often made through the lens of what uh, what we might be able to do without constituting sin. Okay, can I do this without it being sin? But we should instead ask ourselves what we might be able to do that's closest to holiness rather than what's closest to evil without it actually being evil. Uh, And and I want to measure my words carefully here because I don't want to imply that a decision based on the lack of evil is sin. In other words, um, if you are okay with doing something that clearly is not sin because it is not explicitly stated as sin in Scripture, um, but someone else thinks that what you are doing is wrong, um, I, I don't want to imply that that act is Um, absolutely sin, Uh, because make make no mistake, it's not. But Christ does not call us to serve him flippantly and seeing what we could do to nudge the edge of the line. He wants us to be um, as holy as we can be, and in our imperfections, we fail often. Um, Matthew 16, 25, Christ calls us to give up all rights to ourselves, to follow him. John Piper Uh, says it this way. I read this recently. It's very good. Uh, He says this, God gave us a self, not so that we would have something to exalt in, but something to exalt with. 
He gave us a self, not to be the object of our own joy, but the subject of joy. That is not to be uh, the focus of happiness in front of the mirror or the selfie, but the furnace of happiness in front of Jesus. Our desires are meant to lead us to God, in whose presence is fullness of joy. He gave us a self not as an instrument of self-worth, but as an instrument of worship, end quote. That's very good. The reason we exist and the reason um, we are uh, called to be Christians and to follow Christ is to exalt him, not ourselves. And so if we view ourselves in this grid, through this correct grid, it becomes quickly obvious that God has saved us for the purpose of holiness, not personal gratification through heaven. In other words, we are not saved so that we can just go to heaven and enjoy it. We are saved so that we can be holy like God. And so on that notion, we should err always on the side of holiness rather than evil. And so while an action may not be evil in and of itself, it might not be the most holy option for us. Now, don't hear what I am not saying. It very well might be a holy option for us. But we have to determine that, (laughs) which is sometimes difficult. Uh, But I would suggest that erring on the side of holiness will never detract from the mission of glorifying God. Never. Second thought I have is that the line between the appearance of evil and evil itself is often blurred. The appearance or the form of evil and evil itself, those two sometimes can get mixed up. Uh, One reason this is difficult is because sometimes it's ambiguous. And so uh, this, to me, further illustrates the necessity of erring on the side of holiness. We're going to be safe in that way. Um. But it should not be elucidated that the appearance of evil is not synonymous with evil itself. Uh, or it should, be, uh, it should be given that the appearance of evil is not evil itself. Okay, So, so uh, often people get mixed up by saying that because something looks evil, it is therefore evil. And that is not always true. Um, I think this is why Paul is giving these instructions in, in the first place. He doesn't refer to appearance or form as evil. He makes a distinction. He says the appearance or the form of evil. He doesn't say evil. Uh, And so his instructions to avoid it imply that what looks evil might be evil if it contaminates peace among other believers. Um, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 here is written in the context of living at peace with other believers. Okay, So Paul, Paul gives the direction to avoid all forms or appearances of evil to enhance the peace among believers. And so out of respect for each other, uh, we should look not to our own interests, but the, the interests of others. Philippians 2.4, Paul talks about that. And uh, we, we might offend um, others, What might offend others should really be considered very carefully by us. In other words, if this is going to um, detour us from from peace and unity, we should probably not do it. Uh, Now, hear me on this. It's it's impossible to live at peace with everyone at all times. Paul makes that clear in Romans 12, 18. (laughs) As best as possible, live at peace with one another, which implies that it's not always possible, um, although we are Uh, naturally unified in Jesus Christ as the church. But avoiding the appearance or the form of evil is a good start. And so with a blurred line, we need to consider the context, okay? Context is crucial. The appearance or the form of evil is contextual. Let me give you an example. Um, I know ministers in Canada that um, would... Uh, think very uh, lowly of Chris- people who call themselves Christians and yet smoke or dip, okay? Now, here I am ministering in the South in Texas, and it is not uncommon for people to look down upon Christians who drink, yet they will go outside the church and offer up burnt offerings with their cigarettes. Um, it, contextual there, okay? It's contextual. And I've, I've served in churches where drinking alcohol was practiced uh, much. without Well, not much. It was practiced without much thought. Um, in other words, people didn't mind having a drink, having a glass of wine, having a beer, something like that. I have also served in churches. Uh, and just to make myself clear, I was not one of those people. But, but let me... Uh, 
Um, also say that I've also served in churches where, where congregate, uh, congregations consider drinking alcohol to be unarguably wrong. Uh, scripture never, ever says that drinking alcohol is wrong. Uh, so to say that it is a sin explicitly is really to effectively add to Scripture, and we are warned against doing such. But in that context, like it or not, that's the way it is. Some people have a problem with that. Be- believers should consider these perspectives of other people and respect them. And so if drinking or any other action for that matter, whatever it may be, not just drinking, if any of those actions will hurt the peace and unity of the fellowship, Christians shouldn't practice it, or at least uh, should be careful when they do uh, practice those actions. In other words, maybe act outside the presence of those who are offended by the action. Um, The point I'm driving at here is we need to be wise with it. It is contextual. And again, err on the side of holiness and and also realize that you're going to make mistakes and you're not going to make everybody happy. There are going to be things that you do that people don't like. That's just a, a way of life. And so the appearance of evil is contextual. The line's blurry. And we need to consider the context and and exercise wisdom before we act in these ways. Um, Third thought I have here is that Christians should give grace, particularly in ambiguous circumstances. Uh, So the topic I'm talking about here of what appears evil has two contrasting views. Um, There's the view of the the first view of uh, the one who acts, in other words, Um, you are the one performing a particular action, that is your point of view, and then the other perspective is the one who is observing your action. And we are on both ends of those views at different times. And so from the perspective of the observer, we need to live with grace, okay? Um, Particularly in ambiguous circumstances. When I say ambiguous... um, uh, I, I am implying that circumstances are not biblically clear regarding rightness and wrongness. They're not explicit. And so if, if, if Scripture is not explicit on an issue, we need to not impose our personal convictions on others. For example, you may personally believe that a pastor should wear a tie every week. That is nowhere in Scripture, uh, and nothing even close to that. Um, and, and you may have good reason why you feel that way, but as the observer, as a believer in Christ, you should give grace in that area. And you might make your opinion known, uh, but do it in love and grace. Do not try to impose your personal conviction on everyone else and make it a universal conviction. It is clearly not a universal conviction. Uh, so our actions... Yeah, it, but interactions, whatever we do, we should consider who is watching us. In other words, are non-believers or weaker qui- uh, Christians watching us? Um, and, and if they are, how will our action affect them? And, and in asking this question, I am in no way suggesting that the mere nece- uh, the mere necessity of asking the question means it's wrong. In other words, if we have to ask. Um, I, I've heard this before. If you have to ask, should I do it or not, then you shouldn't do it. That's not necessarily the case. Uh, you might just be asking that question so that you can figure out the wisest way to approach that situation. Um, uh, but we might be able to employ what could be questionable at best um, without affecting another person's spirituality. Again, context. Um you might be able to preach a sermon without wearing a tie, <laughs> uh, without it affecting someone's spirituality. And so if our actions affect believers or non-believers in a negative way, then the action is wrong. Um, if our observations, if in our observations, we need to ask ourselves, um, what is this person doing? Is, is, is my opinion of it, is there, of their action Is it based on Scripture or is it baseless? Do I have my own preconceived notions that are not founded and backed up by Scripture? Often that's the case when we really analyze why we think the way we do. And so I think many of our critical opinions, for all of us, myself included, are sometimes baseless. We just have our own preconceived notions and we need to give grace in those areas. They don't really affect the spirituality um, of us or of others. And so we might argue that 
they do or think that they do, but we really have no justification to prove that they do. And so for these baseless opinions, we really should be abounding in grace. And, and I'm not saying these opinions are wrong. Opinions are not wrong. But as far as how we present them to others, we need to be careful. Paul says that just because something is lawful doesn't mean it's beneficial in 1 Corinthians 6.12. But that does not mean that what doesn't benefit us is unquestionably a sin. A lot of people will twist that scripture and say, well, if it doesn't benefit you, that means it's a sin. Not necessarily. Paul's thought here is often used as that argument. But be mindful of the fact that what appears evil to some might not appear evil to to others. Sometimes we get caught in our own Christian bubble and we don't realize that there's a whole world out there that sees things differently than we do. And we can be as, here, here's the truth. Here's the truth, okay? We can be as careful as possible to avoid the appearance of evil throughout our entire lives, but the time comes when others' preconceived notions with no merit should really be disregarded. Uh, <laughs> it shouldn't affect the way we live our life. If we, if we did not employ every action, someone thought was questionable, we might live as vegetables and just stay at our house all day. Uh, some might even consider that evil. Um, so the three perspectives we need to take on this issue are um, we should give grace to the people who practice actions that are not explicitly, uh, explicitly forbidden in Scripture, and we should even ask ourselves why we are offended by the action in the first place. The second thing is we need to err on the side of righteousness in a reasonable manner. In other words, if one's criticisms of our actions are uh, unquestionably baseless, we should discuss these matters with them in love. And then third, we should live at peace and out of respect for one another in the body of Christ. Um, so the final thing I want to say about this, about avoiding the appearance of evil, is that we are always ambassadors for Christ. Always. We don't get a break for it from it. And, and hopefully you don't want to get a break from it. But, but in that light, we should take our call to follow Christ seriously. Knowing Christ and making him known requires a substantial commitment. And with the glory of God as the single issue in every decision we make, big or small, we should serve that aim. No Christian is ever exempt from honoring Christ. And so contextually, God-honoring decisions could look different for different people. Sometimes we look at things so black and white, and there are, sometimes it's not. Sometimes there are difficult issues that we just need to pray about and be wise about and err on the side of holiness. And so being mindful of our context, we need to seek righteousness above evil and always err on the side of holiness and always on the side of grace. Thank you for listening to the Act of Worship podcast. This is Dr. Jonathan Michael Jones. 